Okay, hello, welcome back to another video. Today, I'm going to make a prediction. Now, this is quite a long-term prediction, but one that I'm sure won't surprise any of you who are familiar with the world of elite chess. As I'm sure you can see from the thumbnail and title, today I'll be putting forward my personal opinion and statistical research on which country I think will become the dominant force in world chess in the next 10 to 15 years. We're also going to go through a game played by the man who I believe is to be credited for his country's future world chess domination. But first, before we start making any predictions, let's look at the current top 20 players in the world as of November 2022 to get an idea of which federation is currently at the top. To do this, I went on the FIDE top 100 players list for November 2022, copied and pasted that, and slapped it into a spreadsheet. From this table, I created a secondary table detailing the number of players per country and checking that I had counted correctly using some masterful spreadsheet coding. Then from this table, I created a pie chart with a lot of bright colors to keep all the four-year-olds watching on their mom's phone interested. One quick look at this pie chart tells us that the US and Russia are currently dominating the world of elite chess. Chessmetrics.com's graph of the state of world chess during Bobby Fischer's reign as world champion shows an American leading an almost entirely former USSR top 10. And a quick look down the FIDE world championship list from 1950 to 1990 leaves the impression that these countries have been on top for a long time. Now, some of you may be asking, why did I stop at 1990? or more relevantly, 1988. That is because 1988 was a very special year. It was the year in which India could first claim to have its very own Grand Master, Vishwanathan Anand. In this video, I'm gonna make the case that Vishy is not only one of, but the most influential player of all time. If you can't tell already, in this video, I am arguing that in the next 10 to 15 years, India will dominate the top 20 and be the world's leading chess superpower. I believe that Anand's chess genius and his win over Alexei Shirov to become the world chess champion in 2000 created a ripple amongst the billion people living in India at the time. And today we can see how that ripple turned into a tidal wave of chess brilliance in the country. The main piece of evidence that I'm going to put forward for this can be found by looking at the top 50 juniors in the world as of November 2022. The reason that I'm looking at the top 50 instead of just the top 20 juniors is because their ratings are going to be a lot more volatile, they are younger, there's more room for improvement as opposed to some of the older players who are set in their ways. So repeating the process from the start of the video, I took the top 50 juniors as of November 2022, put them in a table, made that secondary table, and made the pie chart. To me, this data set represents the distribution by country of all the promising young players who I would consider to be candidates for the top 20 within the next 10 to 15 years. A quick look at the hefty orange slice of the pie chart shows an unrivaled dominance by India in the current top 50 junior players in the world. Using another bit of spreadsheet coding wizardry, I took the top 50 juniors and took a mean average of their age and did the same for the top 20 players in the world today. I took the latter average to be a decent estimate for the optimal age to be in the top 20 chess players in the world. However, I do believe that with the meteoric rise of chess computers, the average age of the top 20 in the world will decrease. Alireza Farooja being an example, he has crossed 2800 and was born in the same year as me, 2003. That's a bit tough to take. Rounding the ages accordingly, this means that the players from the top 50 juniors list will be optimal age to be in the top 20 in the world in 10 to 15 years. While India has undoubtedly already become a world chess superpower ever since Anand's influence, they have yet to dominate the top 20 in the same way that we saw Russia or to a lesser extent America dominate that top 20 field. I believe, however, that due to all of this data and watching players like Nihal Sarin, Pragnananda, Gukesh, Arjun Aragaisi, all of these players beating super strong grandmasters all over the place. The India 2 team in the Chennai Chess Olympiad effectively dominating. I mean, in the next 10 to 15 years, we will see India be the reigning superpower of world chess. Let's not forget, however, that all of this has stemmed from one man, the first ever Indian grandmaster, Vishy Anand. And so, while I'd argue that his greatest victory has been in inspiring the wealth of chess excellence that now exists in India, 
he had some very cool victories over the board as well. So today I'm going to take you through one of my favorite of those games. Okay, so let's go through this game. But first, a bit of context. I will be making more videos in the future on Vichy's excellent chess games. However, today I wanted to take you through a game from 1984 that Vishwanathan Anand played at the young age of 14. I was heavily humbled during my analysis of this game, which is a 21 move, near perfect, surgical, principled demolition of the black pieces by Anand with the white pieces, played by someone four years younger than me in an era where chess computers were still, relatively speaking, rubbish. This game occurred in the World Junior Championship, as I said, in 1984, between Vishwanathan Anand, of course, with the white pieces, and Ivan Bor de Souza, who had the black pieces. So let's get into the game. Anand played e4, and de Souza responded with a Sicilian c5, knight f3, and e6 here, the French variation of the Sicilian. Anand plays d4, and after cd4, knight d4, knight f6, and knight c3, this is the normal variation of the French variation of the Sicilian defense. However, here, de Souza plays d6, transposing into the Scheveningen variation. The Scheveningen is a highly theoretical line favored by players such as uh, Alexei Shirov, Judith Polgar, uh, Vasil Vanchuk, all who have, you know, around a thousand games uh, in this line. Generally speaking from here, white goes for bishop to e2, the classical variation, or instead goes for this move g4, the Keres attack. But instead of either of these, Anand plays f this is known as the Matanovich attack, preparing the potential push of e5 as you will later see. D'Souza plays knight to c6, and Adam just brings his bishop to e3, stabilizing that knight on d4, and, you know, clearing the path for that white king to eventually castle queenside. Bishop to e7 here, and Anand goes for the Tal variation, queen to f3, sticking to the idea of removing those pieces out of the way of the king, such that he can castle queenside nice and early. Uh, getting the rook on that lovely open d file. Now, queen f3 is the first move for me that raises a bit of an eyebrow. I mean, putting the queen here before developing the light squared bishop does seem a little bit shaky. However, this is theory. Um, and, you know, this e6 pawn makes it kind of hard for black to actually attack the queen with a move like um, bishop g4. Actually, black's best continuation is e5. And after we would see takes, takes. Uh, and why would have to play f5 to prevent that idea of bishop g4. However, this isn't what we saw in the game as D'Souza decides to take the knight and trade the pieces in the center, and then, of course, recapturing with bishop, and D'Souza plays bishop to d7. And only now does Anand complete his opening goal uh, with the best engine move in the position, castles queenside. After Anand castles queenside, D'Souza slides his queen into a5, putting nice pressure on this a2 pawn here, with the foreshadowing of the idea b5, b4, kicking this knight, taking this pawn, and infiltrating the white king's camp. However, this was not the optimal time to play this idea of queen a5, and Anand, at the age of 14, sees this inaccuracy and punishes it perfectly with the move e5. This is one of the ideas in the Matanovich attack, as I said at the start, that move f4, supporting the push of e5, trying to break open the center of the position and punish the black king for not castling soon enough. D'Souza plays the move bishop to c6, Zvishenzug. Yes, his knight is hanging, but he's going to attack the queen first. And it's not immediately obvious where this queen should actually go, until you remember that Vishwanathan Anand is the man with the white pieces. And so he's not going to move his queen. He's going to play bishop, that is right, bishop, to b5. Now, obviously, bishop to b5 pins this light square bishop on c6 here to the king on e8, such that the queen cannot be taken. Fine, that makes sense. But all of a sudden, it looks like this bishop is very much just hanging. I mean, for instance, if queen takes, what happens? Well, queen takes here, then knight takes queen, bishop takes queen here, and you don't even go in and fork here, you simply take this bishop, and this position is dominating for white. In this line, for instance, black has to find a resource to defend that c7 square, knight d5 being the best idea, but after e takes d6, this bishop doesn't have anywhere pleasant to go. After a line such as bishop to f6 and rook h to g1, we see that Anand's pieces are just far superior, the rooks are on open files, and these rooks are doing nothing. The knight is exerting pressure here. This pawn is ridiculously strong. And I mean, for instance, if we see bishop takes, rook takes, and I mean, rook d8 attacking this uh, this pawn, this is one of the best ideas. There's knight c7 check. And if takes, there's takes here. The rook goes under here. And then there's rook d1. And I mean, yes, he can try and castle, but should he castle? 
the rook goes into d7, this pawn's here, you're going to be completely winning this rook endgame. And weirdly enough, Stockfish gives this position an evaluation of about plus eight. Now, admittedly, that was one quite long and specific line. Uh, I don't really have time in this video to go through every single possibility there, but that is the kind of position that Black would end up in should they take with the queen, just utterly dominated. Initially, um, if queen takes, it's actually a plus 4.4 advantage for white immediately. I don't usually like using the engine evaluations to determine positions, but in one as complex as this, I think it's probably relevant. And you might be thinking, okay, maybe queen takes doesn't work, but surely bishop takes works. Why would bishop takes not work? Well, here we can play queen to b7. Taking that pawn and attacking a bishop and a rook, all this time the knight is still hanging. There are three pieces for black hanging in this position. The evaluation is plus 7.7. .7. I mean, black king is still super weak. Um, if they try and castle, then you can just pick up the knight. You can also pick up the bishop. It's a really good position for white. So funnily enough, after bishop b5, D'Souza can't take. Instead, he goes for quite an intuitive move, knight to d5, stepping out of the way of this pawn. And I mean, if you look at this position, black's position looks really solid. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any gaping problem with it. The knight secured by the pawns, the bishop securing this pawn here. I mean, everything's quite held. There's a lot of pressure being exerted. But Anand sees straight through this facade to the frailty of the Black King still in the center of the board. So how does he punish this? Well, of course, he tears open the center of the board with knight takes knight, forcing the pawn to take the knight here as the bishop is pinned to the king. Then he gets rid of the bishops with takes and takes and finally plays e takes d6, finishing tearing open that e-file such that after bishop takes here, he can play rook to e1 check. And despite the position being materially equal, one look at the king's safety and the activity of the rooks, these rooks being on the center files and these rooks literally being where they started, justifies Stockfish's plus 4.6 evaluation in this position for Vichy. D'Souza has two options here. He can either move his king or block with the bishop. Now, if he'd blocked with the bishop, we would have seen bishop to e7, bishop takes g7, rook to g8, and then bishop to f6, exploiting that pin there and winning the game on the spot. There is no way to defend this bishop um, unless you defend it with the queen, but then after rook takes, queen takes, bishop takes, king takes, you're going to be down, uh, you know, a queen for a rook as black, not a good position. So instead, D'Souza steps across to f8, defending that g7 pawn, but here Anand, clinical as ever, queen g4, threatening checkmate, on the g7 square here. D'Souza plays rook to g8, hopelessly trying to defend this pawn here on g7. And this is where we see just a beautiful move, queen to d7, putting his queen basically as close as it can be to that weak black king, attacking the bishop here, attacking the pawn here. And there's not much more to be done. D'Souza tries to play a queen to d8. I mean, seems to defend this. It seems to tie everything together quite nicely. But in this position, there is a beautiful, knockout punch that Anand delivered. If you want to try and find it, pause the video here. If not, the move is rook to e8. After rook to e8 check, this sequence is completely forced. Queen takes on e8, the only legal move. Then queen takes bishop. That queen has been deflected from the defense of the bishop. The only legal move here again is blocking that diagonal with queen to e7. And just calmly, Anand picks up that c-pawn. Now the real reason he played queen takes c6 here is not to win a free pawn, it's to clear that diagonal towards the king and queen. Anand is ready to play bishop to c5, pinning the queen to her wildly useless husband who really never made it out of the center of the board. So it was after this move, queen takes c6, that D'Souza resigned and Anand won a beautiful game in 21 moves. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed, which I really hope you did, I put quite a lot of effort into, especially the start of this video, um, then, you know, leave a like, comment, all that helps the channel uh, grow, which is obviously what I'm trying to do here. I'll come back to this video in 10 years and say I told you so when the top 20 are all Indian. See you in the next one. Goodbye.